In this demonstration, we're going to look at more graphing. In particular, we're going to look at what makes a good and bad graph. Just a quick overview of what you should really avoid. We're also going to look at line graphs versus scatter plots and why you should normally choose scatter plots over line graphs. We'll then move on to looking at histograms and how we can plot histograms properly in Excel. So let us start with our first bad example of a graph. And this is something that I see quite often in reports which are handed in by students and something that should be avoided at all costs. And the most obvious thing I want to point out on this line graph is the lack of distinct contrast in the colours. So we have this line here which is A, far too thin, it's thinner than the actual grid lines for the rest of the graph, and two, the colour that's been chosen, this very pale blue, is almost identical to the background white. It makes it incredibly hard to see this graph. So when you're plotting graphs or pie charts or any other kind of visual information, make sure you have a high enough contrast between your background and the actual line or symbol or point that you're plotting. Other things to note are the lack of labels on the axes. So we have a y-axis and our x-axis. They have values, but I have no idea what unit those values are in. So in this case, you definitely do need to have some form of label. A third thing I'll just point out while we're here, and we'll see this again in a couple more examples. Our graph itself stops just below the 0.05 on the y-axis. We have all this dead white space at the top here. So we should really rescale the y-axis so it goes from 0 up to 0.05 only, removing this 0.06 dead space. This would allow the graph to be extended all the way up and use this whole area. In this second example, we have a similar line graph plotted. Things I want you to point out in this one are we have a title, just saying iron at the moment. We also have a key, again, just saying iron. Now in this graph here, we only are ever plotting one thing, and this is iron values. So there is no need to duplicate a title and a key. In this case, the key is superfluous. We should be removing the key. This would allow us to gain all this white space here and extend our graph over to the right hand side. This is a more efficient use of the space we have. Similarly, if you look at our y-axis in this case, and a bit like the previous case, we have this dead space between 0.05 and 0.06, that could be removed. And on our x-axis down the bottom here, we have inappropriate labeling of the actual values. So we have a minus 10. What does minus 10 mean in this graph? We have no idea, there are no values. So this should be removed. Our graph should be centered on zero here. Equally, on this side, on the right hand side, we have no values above 40. So all the values 40, 50, and 60 on this x-axis should be removed. This would allow the graph to stretch out from its current compressed state over to the right hand side. Again, using the maximum amount of space we have in a more efficient manner. Now the third and final bad graph example is something I occasionally see in student work that's handed in and it really shouldn't happen. You just need to think logically about what you're plotting to start with. So I'll just go through and explain what's wrong with this graph. This graph is plotting this little table of discrete data at the top here where we have localities A, B, C and D and at each locality We've counted up the number of trilobytes, the number of brachiopods, and the number of crinoids. Now, there's no relationship between localities A, B, C, and D. Similarly, there's no correlation between trilobytes, brachiopods, and crinoids at each of the localities. So each of these values is a discrete bit of data. So if you go and look at our chart over here, you'll suddenly realize that, say we take A of our key, so this is locality A, Locality A has been plotted as a single point here for trilobites, a secondary point up here for brachiopods, and a third point down here for crinoids. But the mistake that's been made is they've been joined by a line. What does this line actually mean? 
it doesn't mean anything. It's made up. There is no correlation between the number of trilobites at locality A here and the number of brachiopods here. This line is useless. And similarly with all the other localities here. They should not be plotted as a line graph. This is where a scatter graph would come in, where we have discrete points with no lines joining them up, showing the actual distribution at the different localities for our group of trilobites, our group of brachiopods, and our group of crinoids. So always think about what you want to plot, and once you've plotted your graph, go through an idiot check what you've actually plotted. Does it make sense? If you were to give this plot to someone else, would they be able to understand it? So this brings us nicely on to looking at line graphs versus scatter plots in more detail. And why scatter plots are generally more powerful and the default graph you should go to for plotting XY data. So to demonstrate this, I'm just going to open up a new worksheet with some data in. And here's our data. We have three columns. We have our sample column going from 1 to 36. As with some previous demonstrations, just note that the sample number is not continuous. There are gaps, for instance, around the 5, 8 mark. We're missing 6 and 7, and there are other gaps along here. So although we've got 36 samples, we don't necessarily have 36 data points. We have another column called millimeters, and this is the number of millimeters from the start of our sampling that each of these iron values has been taken from. So imagine that this is a core logging exercise, as in a rock core. And someone has started at the beginning of the core, then gone 200 millimeters, taken an iron sample, got another 100 millimeters, take another iron sample, etc. So that's what the millimeters represent. And then we have our iron values. So the amount of iron at each of these sample points. Just note that the iron values are all below one. So the first thing we want to do is plot our data up. And in this case, we want to plot iron values against position in millimeters in our sampling strategy. So to do this, we select our two data columns, our millimeter and our iron column. We can go up to insert and we come across to our insert line or area chart button. I'm going to select the line chart with markers so we can see each point and just press insert. So that inserts the chart. I'm just going to drag it out so we can make it a slightly more elongate chart so we can fit our scatter plot down the bottom here next so we can compare the two. So the first thing to do before we get onto the scatter plot is just look at our chart for our line. There are some problems here and as in previous demonstrations those problems are easily solved. So what are the problems? Well firstly we're plotting our millimeters as a line. We don't want this. We want to plot our millimeters as our x values. Our iron values are plotting, but they're so small compared to the rest of the values we're plotting that it's just becoming a flat line along the base. Our y values currently are incorrect, and this is because, again, we're plotting millimetres, which are much larger in value. They're up to 3,600, compared to our iron values, which don't get above 1. So let's fix those problems. So we can come down to our select data. I'm going to remove the millimeters to start with. So this will get rid of this blue plotted line. The second thing I'm going to do is come over to our horizontal category axis label, press edit, and I'm going to select the millimeters. Say OK. As you can see in the background, Excel has updated our chart. So we now have our millimeters correctly along our X axis and we've got rid of the millimeters plotting as a line. So now our FE values are showing correctly. So I can say, okay, I'm happy with the data now. Two other things we just need to solve. So as in our bad graph example, we currently have iron in the title, but we also have a key that says iron. We don't need both. So I'm going to remove the legend. So just untick that. Next thing, I want to add some axis labels because I don't know what these values are. 
I mean, we should be saying millimeters or something similar along the bottom here. So come up to our big plus button, find axis titles, and click the big tick button. We can now come in and edit our axis title labels. So I'm just going to call this sample brackets millimeter. And just yeah, position that somewhere down the bottom there. And then on this side here, I'm just going to call this FE value. So now we have a properly formatted line chart of our data that is correct. We have millimeters along the bottom and we have our FE values along the side. And our iron values plotted on our graph with lines interconnecting each point. So now let's look at the same data, but this time with a scatter graph. So to insert a scatter graph, we do exactly the same as with the line graph. We select our data, in this case the millimeter and the FE column. We go up to insert. We come along to our chart box, but this time we go down to our insert scatter XY or bubble chart option. Click on that. And you can see we have several different types of scatter graph available. We can plot just the raw data. So this will put individual XY points on our graph. As you can see, Excel is putting a preview up below. We can have those points joined by a smooth line. We can have just the smooth line. We could have the points with a straight line in connect interconnecting them or just the straight lines themselves. Now for a direct comparison, because we had a line graph before, I'm going to choose the scatter with straight lines and markers. So click that to insert the chart. And I'll just move it down here and just resize it to roughly the same as we had above. Now straight away, you can see that it's automatically picked up the Y axis along the side here and the X axis along the bottom here. And this is because scatter graphs by default will plot X, Y data only. So when we selected our two columns as such, our B column became our X values and the C column became our Y values. And then it plotted each of these individual points here and then just joined them with a line. So other things we just need to do quickly in order to make this a fairer comparison is sort out our X, Y labels or axes. Sort out where our graphs are finishing. As you can see, this one here is finishing correctly around the 3600 mark. However, we've got all this white space we need to remove. So I'll just go through and do that now. So the first thing I'm going to do is just add in our axis titles. Let's go to the chart, press the big plus button, tick the axis title, come back to our chart and then just type in our titles. So once again, we want sample brackets millimeter. And then on this side, this FE value. So now that's starting to look a bit more like our chart at the top here. The next thing we want to look at is sorting out this white space at the end here. And that's controlled by our X axis. So we can click on our x-axis and if we have our format widget open on the right hand side this will automatically open if not you can always right click and say format axis to open the widget and the bit we're interested in is under axis options and it's this bound values we've got a minimum bound and a maximum bound and this controls where our axis starts on the left hand side so that's the minimum and where it ends on the right hand side the maximum as you can see, it goes from zero to 4,000 at the moment. So we want to change this to 3,600. Enter that value, press enter. We now have our graph going up to 3,600. However, you'll also notice that it now starts at minus 400. This is because Excel is trying to be clever and all it's done is it's moved our entire range of the original axis down by 400. So to solve this, we just go up to minimum and we type zero in here. This forces it to start at zero. Now, if we look at our chart, we're correctly going from zero up to 3,600. 
next thing to do is just look at the values we're showing. So how many values do we want to show on our y-axis? What is the spacing between them? Currently we're showing values every 500. Whereas up here we're showing them every well, 200, 100, 100, 100, 300. It's random. But let's get something similar. So again, we come back to our format axis widget and we're looking at our units down here. So all these charts have two units in both directions, the Y and the X. We have a major and a minor. So the major is set on this to be 500. Let's set it to 200 and you'll see what happens. So on our graph, we now have major axis grid lines in our Y axis every 200. It set the minor to 40 automatically, but as we're not showing any minor axes at this point, we're not interested in that particular value. But this is good enough now to compare the two graphs and see what the differences are. So the first thing to note is that on the line chart at the top here, it has equally spaced out all our sample values. So it goes from 0 to 200, and then from 200 to 300, the same physical distance between them. Yet this is 200, and this is 100. And then again from 300 to 400, again 100 across. 400 to 500, 100 across. We now get to where our gap would be in our data, in terms of our sample numbers. We suddenly jump 300 from 500 to 800 across the same distance. So this is skewing how our line graph is actually being plotted. If we look at the scatter graph, because it's only looking at the XY data, it will always plot our millimeter sample value in the correct position. So we do have a gap of 200 between our first point and our second point. We then have a gap of 100 to our third point. Again, another gap of 100 to our fourth point, a gap of 100 to our fifth point. We then have a gap of 300 to our next point. So this is where a scatter graph really comes into its own. It allows you to have a x-axis that has data and values plotted which are not sequential. Compared to the line graph, where it assumes all your data will be sequential with the same distance gaps between them. And this is the reason why, by default, you should always use a scatter plot rather than a line graph. You're far more likely to get results which are plotted correctly with a scatter graph than you are with the line graph. Now, that's not to say that you should always plot your scatter plots with lines connecting each of the points. So a bit like in the bad data example, we don't necessarily want to have every point connected. It depends on whether the data is discrete or not. And just to drive home this message, I'm going to do a quick example with some other data. So here we have some more element data. We have our sample numbers and we have three elements, iron, magnesium and calcium. Now this time what I want to do is plot the calcium values against the magnesium values. So I'm going to select those two columns, come up to insert, choose our scatter plot. I'm going to choose the scatter plot with lines and plot it. Now straight away you can see that this isn't correct. What we're doing is we're joining lines up between discrete data points that have no connections. Also, these data points are moving up and down the y and x axes randomly. So the correct way to plot this would be to select our two data points, so our x and our y data points, come up to our insert, go to our scatter graph, but this time just choose the scatter plot that only plots the points. As you can see, our graph is now showing data in a much better manner, in a correct manner, a manner that can be used. Now, if you had made the mistake and chosen the line graph here, how do you correct that? And how do you turn this graph into a scatter plot without lines? Well, there's a simple way to do this. 
What you want to do is right click on your chart, come down to where it says change chart type, click on that. And this brings up the change chart menu. And you can change your data that you've plotted to any other kind of chart. Now a lot of these won't work because of the data you've inputted, a lot of them might. But just on our example, what you can do is just quickly go across here, change back to the scatter without the lines between, say OK, we've now plotted the data correctly. Now we have a scatter plot plotted with just our XY coordinates. This is a good opportunity to demonstrate how we could fit a trend line to this. Now trend lines are used to show whether there's any correlation between our X and Y values. So I'm just going to remove our second chart here and increase the size of our first chart. And we can see that we have our X, Y values. And we would imagine there should be some kind of trend or correlation that comes along this sort of position. Where you could say that if you had an X value of say 0.03, then you would expect a Y value of somewhere around 0.0045 or five for instance. Now in Excel, it's quite easy to add a trend line. What we can do is come up to our big plus button and come down to our trend line option at the bottom here and tick that. Now you could just leave it as it is with the default trend line, but if you come across to this little arrow in the corner here next to the trend and click on that, you'll see that we have lots of other options. We have the linear trend line, which is what it has defaulted to, so a straight line. We could fit an exponential line, and then there are other different types. Some of them, a bit like the moving average, really doesn't work on the data we currently have. But if you click on more options, what it does is it opens up the format trend line widget. And this allows you to access all these different types and their extra options. And to do this, you click on the trend line option button. And here you can see all our different options. We can have our exponential, our linear, logarithmic, polynomial, power, and moving average. So it all depends on which one you want. For the moment, we're just gonna stick with our linear one. Now I'm just gonna go back up here and I'm gonna go to our fill and line, go across to our button, and I'm just gonna change the color of our line. So it's different from our points. I'm just gonna change it red for the moment, make it easier to see. So we now have a basic trend line. What else can we do? Well, sometimes it's useful to know what the equation is that that trend line is fitted to. And we can add that to our chart. So we can come down to our trend line options, come all the way to the bottom here, and you'll see that we have these tick boxes. And the one we're interested in is display equation on chart. So if we tick that, You'll see on our chart, the equation has now been put down. Now this equation, again, is an element, so we can move that and place it wherever we want. Similarly, we can format it, maybe give it a red border. What else can we do with trend lines? Well, currently our trend line starts and stops at the lowest point and the highest point in relation to where the maximum and minimum data points are being plotted. Sometimes you want your trend line to extend out from your data, either in the positive or negative direction. So to do this, you can come down and you can come to this forecast option. So you can forecast it forwards. So if I increase this just by one for the moment, you'll see that we've increased our forecast by one. And that's a value of one along our x-axis. In our case, we don't want to forecast it that far into the future. So we probably want to forecast it something like 0.1. Again, a little too much, just because of our data. So put some extra zeros in. That's better. And similarly on the backwards, we might want to do something similar. There we go. As you can see, because it's gone beyond the zero point, we've now added a negative to our chart.
Now previously I said that if you've got data plotted, but you've got negative values and that data doesn't go into the negative values, you shouldn't have that. Well, here's an exception. This is because your trend line does go past zero into the negative. Therefore, that value is now a value that is useful. Other things you might want to display on your trend line and your chart is something called the R squared value. Now, the R squared value is a statistical measure of how close the data is to your fitted trend line. So how close is all this data cloud to our calculated trend line? So if we go back to our trend line, click on it, bring up our former trend line, we can click this extra little checkbox at the bottom here that says display R squared value on chart. So tick this, then up to where our equation is, we end up with an R squared value. In this case, our R squared value is 0.8867. So what does that mean? Well, in Excel, the R squared value is between 0 and 1. Zero indicates that the model explains none of the variability of the response of the data around its mean. So in layman's terms, if we had a value that was zero or near zero, it means that our trend line is not fitting our data well or at all. Whereas if we have an R square value that is one or near one, it means that our data is fitting our trend line well or very well. An R squared value like 0.5 means that we can't tell one way or the other whether the trend line is fitting the data or not. Now at this point it should be noted that the Excel calculated R squared value that you are seeing on screen is not necessarily the best measure of R squared. There are other ways to calculate this and this depends a lot on the data you are starting with. And it will depend on whether your data is parametric or non-parametric. Now we'll get onto what these terms mean later on in the course. But at this point, just bear in mind that R squared value as given by Excel on the graphs is not always the best R squared value you can calculate. The next thing I'd like to show you is how we can add error bars to our charts. So for this, I'm going to change our data to some data where we have known errors. So we have our sample numbers again, we have some iron values, and now we have plus and minus error values for each of our sample points. So the first thing I'm going to do is just plot up our data, our samples versus our iron. So as normal, up to insert, I'm going to choose a scatter plot, I'm going to choose the scatter plot with lines. I'll just make this bigger so we can see what we're doing. Now, I'm not going to format it by adding all the titles, etc., etc. What we're interested in is how can we display our plus and minus values for each data point on our graph. So the first thing we want to do is click on our graph, come down to where it says error bars, tick the error bar checkbox, and you'll see that Excel has added in horizontal and vertical error bars. From our little arrow menu on the side here, you'll see that we have certain error bar formattings we can choose from. Standard error, percentage, and standard deviation. But for the moment, we're just going to click more options. And this opens up the format error bar widget. Now, before we go any further, it's worth pointing out that both the vertical and the horizontal error bars are individual elements. So if I go back to the chart, I can click on the horizontal error bars separately from the vertical error bars. And as I click on each one, you'll notice that the format error bar is changing from vertical error bar to horizontal error bar. Now, because they're separate elements, it means you can remove them individually. So for instance, in our example here, we have no need for a horizontal error bar. There is no error in our sample numbers. So I can click on the horizontal error bar and press delete on the keyboard. And this just removes the horizontal error bars, leaving our vertical ones. Now, how do we format these vertical error bars? 
so that they have the values between our plus column and our minus column over here. First of all, you click on your error bar. You come over to where it says your vertical error bar and your format error bar widget, all the way down to where it says error amount. Now we've got it on the default, which is standard error. This is just Excel adding in a standard error bar. And this value and the size of the error bar will be based on the data you've inputted. What we actually want to do here is have some custom data. So we say custom and say specify value. And this opens the custom error bar box. This allows you to add in a range of data for the positive error values and a range of data for the negative. So for the positive, we select our positive column and for our negative, we select our negative column. Once we're happy, we say OK. And when we look back at our chart, you'll see that our error bars have now been customized to the values we had over in our table. Using this system will allow you to create graphs with customized error bars with specific values based on the data that you're inputting. And as with all elements within a chart, you have the standard customization options for formatting as well. So we could, for instance, just for argument's sake, change our error bars to be red and make them stand out from the rest of our graph. Now, the final thing to show in this demonstration is how to create histograms. Now, histograms are a specialist kind of chart. So for this, we're going to use some data. And this data is some student mark data, where we've got student marks in column A. In column C, D and E, I've set out this little mini table and we'll be using this to work out the frequency of marks for various bins. Now, just a reminder, a histogram is a graphical representation of the distribution of numeric data. And it does this by binning the data into discrete, non-overlapping bins. So for instance, a histogram is a perfect way to represent this student mark data, where each of the bins represents one of our classifications. So for instance, a bin may be 0 to 40, and that bin represents a fail. The next bin will be between 40 and 50, and that represents a third class, etc., etc., all the way up to 70 to 100 representing a first. So what we need to do before we start graphing anything is calculate our frequencies for these bins. And that is how many students have marks that fall within, say for instance, the fail category or the third category. In order to do this, we have two options. We can either write a conditional statement that will go through and count the student mark if it is between a set of values. So for example, if we wanted to calculate the number of fails, we could come to our E2 cell, start with an equals, and we want to use the count if function. Count if. So it counts the number of cells within a range that meet a given condition. So we want to set the range to our full range of student marks. Once we're happy, put our comma in, and we want to add some criteria. So in this case, we want to count any marks that are below 40. So we can say below with the less than sign, 40, close our quotation marks, close the brackets, press enter. We now know that we have three students within our fail bin, and we could do something similar for each of our categories. Now on this small table, that's not too much effort, but say for instance, you wanted to have several hundred bins or several thousand bins in your histogram. The last thing you want to be doing is manually calculating each and every bin. So how can we do this in a more efficient and semi-automatic way? Well, Excel has a built-in function for this, and that's called the frequency function. So if we come up here and I'll just clear out what we had before, 
So we start with a clean table. This time I will put an equal sign in and I'll start typing the word frequency. As you can see, it's the only one that pops up. I double click that and what it's asking for is a data array. So our data array is our student mark data. So as before, we select that, put a comma in. The next thing it's asking for is something called the bins array. Now the bins array is our breakpoints as well as our names down the side here. So what we want to do is select both those columns. We can then close our brackets, press enter. And you'll see that our formula has automatically been entered all the way down our table here. Now, Excel has come up with this formula spilled little dialog. And this means that we have multiple values returned and it's automatically spilled them into its neighboring cells. And in this case, this is exactly what we want. So we can say, got it. So what it's done is it's taken our first equation, worked out that we have three within our fail category. It's then looked at our breakpoints between 40 and 50 and counted six and done that for each of these breakpoints all the way up to 100. Now the reason we have zero at the end here is that it got to zero at 100 and there's no value beyond that. And we don't have any students that have exactly 100 in their marks. So this here is actually a bin with a single value of 100 with zero students in. We will simply ignore this value. You could try deleting it. However, you'll find that Excel won't allow you. So just to demonstrate, if I click on that and then press delete, it won't delete that. It will put all the values back. And similarly, if I press backspace on that cell and then click off, that value returns. This is because it's integrated into this array function value. So as I said, we're just going to ignore it. So now we've got our student frequency data, what we need to do is plot a bar chart with bars that have height relating to the student frequency. And each of those bars should represent one of these classes. So how do we do it? Well, what we do is we select our data, our class data and our student frequency data. We can then go up to our insert, our charts, and we choose our insert column or bar chart. Select the bar chart, come down and just select the bog standard 2D clustered column. We now have a histogram where you can see each category and each category represents the total number of students in those categories. So this is how you can produce a manual histogram in Excel correctly. Now, why am I telling you to produce your histograms manually? Well, the reason is so you can avoid using the built-in Excel histogram chart making function. So I'll just demonstrate what that does. So say, for instance, we want to choose all our marks again. So I'll just select them. And we go to insert, come along, and we come down to where it says insert a statistical chart. Drop this down. And you'll see that we do have two histogram charts available. I'll choose the first one. Now, as you can see, it has plotted a histogram. However, the big difference here is that it has automatically chosen the bins for you. This would be fine if all your bins were equal distance and they all started at the lowest value of your data range and went up to your highest value of your data range. However, that is very rare. And certainly with our previous example, with our marks here and our bins, our bins are not all equal sized. So for instance, the first bin, the fail bin, has 40 in it. Every bin thereafter up to 70 has 10 in it. And then 70 to 100 is 30. So we have unequal sized bins. 
Excel's built-in histogram chart making function cannot cope with this. And therefore, I would always recommend you create your histograms manually. It also means that you have more control over the data that's going into your chart and you can see the values represented in your worksheet. This means that you can idiot check these student frequency values against your actual data and just doubly make sure that what you are plotting is what you think you are plotting, i.e. is it correct? In terms of additional formatting of the histogram, you would, as with any other chart, just click on the elements, come across your format widget over here, and then just select your individual options on how you want to format your data. So for instance, we might want to change our column color, let's say orange. One thing you may find with histograms is you might want to remove the gaps between your columns and make it more like this bottom histogram here. And this is done by clicking on our bars. Make sure we have the entire series of bars. You can get individual bars to color them separately just by double clicking on individual ones. For this, we want all of them. We come over to our format data series, make sure we're on the series option. We can come down here to where it says series overlap and gap width, and we can change these until our histograms columns line up as we wish. If you put it down to zero, you'll find that they are completely in line. You may find that you want a slight gap, so maybe 2% gap between them. You get a much nicer looking histogram. And of course, all the other chart options are where you would expect them.